This is Tom Kozlik, Head of Strategy and Credit at Hilltop Securities, back again with another public finance-focused podcast. Today, we're joined by Dan White, a director at Moody's Analytics. Moody's Analytics is an economic analysis and forecasting company and subsidiary of Moody's Corporation. And I'd like to highlight that Moody's Analytics is a different and separate company distinct from Moody's Investor Service, which is the subsidiary that assigns bond ratings to public finance entities. Dan was a key and lead author, along with Emily Mandel and Colin Seitz, of the firm's recent economic analysis titled Stress Testing States, COVID-19, a year later. And the report is available to non-subscribers at economy.com. I will make sure to tweet a link to the report again when we publish this podcast. And I tweeted a link to the report back when it first came out at the end of February and have referred to it many times since, both online and other podcasts, uh, in articles, and in my published reports as well. And actually, I've been referring to uh, Dan's forecast, not just this most recent one, but those going back to the first forecast that was published just post-COVID, in April of 2020. And that is a good lead into the first topic I'd like to ask about. I was wondering, Dan, if you could explain how the results have evolved since April 2020 to this most recent version of your analysis. Thanks, Tom. Um, and there's a lot that's different from now and uh, last April. Obviously, a, a lot has changed in a year, a lot of surprises. Um, but I think the biggest thing that's changed and probably the biggest um, influence on uh, our different scores in uh, stress testing we did a year ago is the economy. Uh, if you had told us a year ago that, you know, we'd have a vaccine already rolled out, that we would have a, a good portion of the country already vaccinated, and that a lot of our industries had started to figure out ways to operate around COVID-19, I think we would have all taken it in a heartbeat. Um, so the big change is, you know, the number of, not just the number of jobs that we still have, you know, we're still down about 10 million jobs from where we were a year ago. Uh, but really the incomes have been incredibly uh, resilient. We're um, actually up a little bit in terms of uh, national um, personal income. Uh, and that makes a big difference for state and local government fiscal conditions because tax revenues are really uh, more of a function of revenues they, than they are uh, a function of, of uh, employment. And so when we see that resilience that has come through from uh, all of the stimulus that's come through, the enhanced unemployment insurance, the PPP programs, all of those things have really helped to get us in a much better place economically. And in turn, we're in a much better place uh, in terms of revenues and expenditures at the state level. So what did the what did the fiscal shock that you were forecasting look like in April of 2020 compared to now and then what did the amount of federal you know how does the amount of federal aid then decrease or create that kind of net shortfall and could you compare what it is that you were projecting and what you what you were seeing in April of 2020 compared to what you uh published you know just about 3 weeks ago 4 weeks ago Sure. So if we look back to April 2020, our expectation was that uh, what we would classify as a state uh, fiscal shock. And by fiscal shock, we mean basically the amount that the tax revenues have decreased relative to zero. So just using a, an inflationary baseline. And then also the amount that um, public spending has increased, especially specifically Medicaid, uh, above and beyond what we thought the baseline forecast was going to be. Uh, one of the things we found during the Great Recession was that increases in social services spending, uh, especially mandatory social services spending, can be just as harmful to state budgets as a decrease in tax revenue. So we, we combine those two forces together to give a, a fiscal shock or basically the amount of money that states would have to come up with through um, spending cuts or tax increases or plugging holes from reserves in order to uh, kind of get through the, the next uh, fiscal year. We offset that, or, and I should say, so in last April, we expected that hole to be about $250 billion worth of fiscal shock mm -hmm. um, hitting states in fiscal years 2020, 2021, which we're currently in, and then fiscal 2022, which begins in July for most states. Um, we netted that out against federal aid, which at the time, you know, sources like CBO and uh, a couple other very reputable um, uh, outfits were, were estimating would be about $150 billion um, over the course of the pandemic. Uh, 
Um, now, that's obviously much less than states have gotten in the aggregate. $150 billion is what we felt was available to them at the time to really uh, backfill um, state budgets. So a lot of the money that was awarded, especially as part of the CARES Act, came with uh, a lot of uh, a lot of strings attached to it in terms of it, it had to be used explicitly for pandemic-related um, uses. So buying PPE equipment for emergency medical services, those kinds of things. They really couldn't be used just to backfill a revenue shortfall. Um, however, you know, since that time, we've obviously seen a lot more uh, federal aid come through. Uh, and if we kind of compare that to what our shortfall is, so if we go back to the, the report we did maybe just three weeks ago, um, we saw that the overall amount of fiscal shock fall from the $250 billion last April to $150 billion this year. So a decline of $100 billion over the course of a year because of the uh, improving economy. Net that out with a roughly an equal amount of, of federal aid to what we were expecting to see, and you see much smaller shortfalls uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about $50 billion for states um, before even this recent round of uh, stimulus was passed. Right, so the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 is sending about $220 billion of direct relief to states. Now, do you think that that's an effective fiscal policy strategy to help states that have been negatively impacted from COVID and from the waves of shutdowns? Well, you know, it's definitely enough. Um, and as a matter of fact, we'd, we'd probably say it was probably too much in terms of just mm -hmm. getting states back on their feet, avoiding um, tax increases, avoiding spending cuts. Um, however, if, you know, if the point of the bill was to increase uh, or stimulate economic activity in the economy, I think what, what Congress is basically doing is they're, they're making a very calculated but risky, uh, but very calculated bet um, that states and local governments are going to be able to drive some of that uh, economic activity more efficiently than some of the near-term federal programs that we talk about. So especially when we look at um, things like unemployment insurance, like the checks that go directly to taxpayers, that is all designed as pure sugar that's intended to just boost economic activity right away, so right now. Um, a lot of the um, the stimulus so far that has been missing has been some of those longer term issues like um, infrastructure, which I know you've talked about a lot, Tom, and um, some of the, mm -hmm. the you know job training programs and ways to get people you know beyond you know 2021. How do we get kind of ease our way out of this recession as opposed to just getting that sugar high now? And states and local governments are in a unique position to do that because they have a lot of needs that need to be invested in long-term, one-time projects. So the infrastructure we talked about, but also IT infrastructure, uh, broadband, um, a lot of those programs uh, are going to generate economic activity out over a much longer period of time. And so by investing in those programs, uh, we might get a little bit more bang for our buck um, than just throwing that money into, you know, UI or something more generic like that. So is the right way that we should be looking at this and looking at your numbers is that uh, that net shortfall that you have published of $56.6 billion, should we then compare that to the $220 billion of direct relief for U.S. state? Is your point being that it might be, you know, a little much? Exactly, yeah. So if you if you do that okay. uh, that arithmetic, it's, it's about four times as large as what we think states need in order to not have to lay anybody else off and not have to raise taxes. Mm -hmm. um, so it's what's that, that's that extra $150, $160 billion, what do states do with that? That's where that economic stimulus really plays into, you know, trying to make this move the economy as opposed to just not hurt the economy. Right. Well, and, you, and you, one of the things that you just mentioned was the last item that I wanted to ask about. Uh, state and local governments have shed about 1.3 million workers since the beginning of COVID, and that's about twice as many as what were let go in the wake of the 08 financial crisis. I was wondering if you had some insight to share with everyone about the nature of those job losses and what we can expect in the near term with state and local government employment levels, uh, especially as a result of the, you know, not only the 220 billion that's going to states, but the, you know, uh, the 350 billion that's going to state and local governments. And there was another 120 billion sum for uh, K through 12 schools and the American Rescue Plan Act. Yeah, that's a good point, Tom, and something I think a lot of people are going to be paying close attention to, and they should. 
Um, but I, I think people might be a little surprised when we don't, you know, immediately see a, a huge uptick in state and local government employment. You know, most school districts in the country still doing some form of remote learning um, than they are uh, a result of direct budget implications. So um, just because those budgets are in much better shape doesn't necessarily mean we're going to bring all those those folks back into the classrooms immediately. And I think it's more closely related to how quickly we can reopen schools, get kids back into the classrooms. Because most of those jobs, they're not necessarily teacher jobs, but they're, you know, facilities jobs. They're jobs where people will need to physically be in the building. And if we don't have enough students in the building, those jobs aren't coming back. So think, um, you know, bus drivers, um, custodians, those, those kinds of jobs uh, are really still the ones that are missing and those are going to be more related to the, the pace of, of returning to the schools not necessarily just because the, the budget's in, in better shape so look for those to come back probably by the fall so when you know most schools hopefully will be opening in person in the fall of 2021 um, but not right away so if we don't see a big huge you know uptick in jobs don't we shouldn't hit the panic button immediately don't be surprised okay that makes a lot of sense well, thank you very much for shedding uh, some light on this analysis. Uh, one of the last things I wanted to ask is, are you going to be updating these numbers uh, in the near term, or is this the uh, is is this what it is, is this the last that we can expect? Um, uh, what is the future of the state revenue forecasting and stress testing that you're going to be doing? Well, normally this is a report that we do once a year. Um, and, okay. you know, Colin and Emily on our team are going to be very happy to hear that this is something we're not going to do quite as frequently as we've done over the last year. We've been updating it every other month, more or less, since last mm -hmm. April. Um, now that the, the new ARP money is there, um, it's less pressing, but what we'll it certainly do is when we get to the fall and we've got, you know, full year fiscal 2021 numbers for all the states, we'll update this to get a better idea of exactly, you know, how we did, how our, our forecasts worked out um, and kind of what the potential budget shortfalls could be going forward if there are any uh, once we get a better sense of not only the, the 2021 budgets, but also how that ARP money is being distributed across the states. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, this is uh, Tom Koslick from Hilltop Securities. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dan White from Moody's Analytics for uh, taking the time to, to go over his uh, most recent uh, stress testing analysis. And uh, I want to thank everybody who joined us today. And I look forward to uh, talking with you again uh, soon, Dan. I appreciate it. Thanks for uh, taking the time today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Tom. Anytime.